Drexel University banned inconsiderate jokes <laughs> and wait for it, inappropriately directed laughter. <laughs> I'm John Tierney with Greg Lukianoff, who is, among many things, he's the first ever recipient of the Playboy Foundation Freedom of Expression Award. I, I had to mention that. I had to mention that at the Museum of Sex. Now, Greg is a, um, he's a, he's a lawyer and an author of a terrific new book called Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship, and the End of American Debate. And it tells about his struggles as the as a lawyer and as the uh, head of FIRE, which is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And they have been fighting the good fight um, against campus censorship, defending students' rights, and protecting this thing called the First Amendment, which is, uh, of all places in the world, you think that, it, uh, that the academy would be a place the treasure's at, but it turns out to be one of the most restrictive places. And Greg has been doing just a great job fighting it. It's a great book. And we had planned to start talking about some of the stories in it, some of the uh, about the new Victorians on campus who are censoring uh, all kinds of obscenities, kind of anything at all. But there was some news last week uh, that we want to start with. It's really too important. And, uh, and at the risk of offending someone here and violating uh, a new federal law, <laughs> Greg, what the fuck happened last week? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I came prepared with all sorts of cute stories. And after being asked to do the Museum of Sex speech, um, there was a... It, conveniently, weirdly, but also sadly for the students, a real uptake in, in, in sort of traditional cases where, you know, there was a, a newspaper in, in New Mexico, a student newspaper in New Mexico that produced a sex edition, and it got censored by the uh, by the administration. They gathered up all the copies of it, they confiscated it, and they put a, like, basically a proud statement on the website explaining, yeah, we shut it down because we didn't like the content of the newspaper. So there's been a big uptick in cases like that, but this has all been completely eclipsed by the fact that, and to give a little bit of a little bit of background. Um, the uh, what a lot of people don't understand is that um, harassment has been the go-to theory for uh, speech codes since the 1980s. Um, this is not a coincidence. This is very intentional. The the the, 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 the people who are sort of considered the um, sort of uh, forebears of speech code theory on campus in the 80s are people like Mary Matsuda and Richard Delgano, and they always said that, that the, the way we can go after a speech that's offensive on, uh, to, on the basis of race and gender is through harassment codes. And, this, and these have been defeated in decision after decision since 1989 because the courts don't fall for this sleight of hand. You can't just dub something harassment but then redefine it as anything that offends anybody, which they've done. But this gets defeated in courts. This got defeated in the court of public opinion over and over again. And fire in its nearly 15 years, we've been fighting for a, a definition that we radically borrowed from the Supreme Court of what harassment should mean. It's called a, in a case called Davis, the only case that actually deals with the state of, um, uh, of harassment law as it applies to the educational uh, framework that, that actually considers First Amendment considerations and the impossibility of preventing people from being offended all the time, that um, has a narrow, uh, pure, de 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 workable definition of harassment that we've been advocating for, and we're getting great progress. We, uh, every single speech code lawsuit we've been involved in, we've won. It's been nothing but victories against these kind of codes because they're laughably unconstitutional. Well, we have editorials talking about this. We go down to the Hill. We explain that we want to just get this to be a clear, narrow definition to prevent the kind of shenanigans we see on college campuses. Thought we were totally winning this fight. And then on Thursday, um, in the context of a letter to the University of Montana to deal with sexual assault cases, um, for some reason, the Department of Education and the Department of Justice took it upon itself to redefine harassment instead of this narrowly tailored definition to this any unwelcome sexual uh, sexual speech. That's it. Um, and, they, and the other thing that they did was they eliminated the reasonable person, the objective standard. Um, the, the one thing that actually prevented, that was at least in theory, supposed to prevent you from being brought up on frivolous, ridiculous charges, was the idea that it's supposed to be both subjectively offensive and objectively offensive. By objectively offensive, that means that something that your average person would find highly offensive, not, uh, not just that it's limited to uh, you know, the most sensitive person in the room. They explicitly got rid of the objective standard. Um, so we now have any unwelcome uh, uh, sexual speech that any, anybody finds offensive, even if unreasonable, is now defined as harassment. They completely divorced the idea of severe, persistent, and pervasive. They completely dismissed 
the Davis decision. And the, the plain, if you take the plain language of this code seriously, and believe me, everybody does on college campuses. Everybody looks at what the Department of Education says about this stuff because they have all the control over Title IX funding, and they have, all, uh, and they have control over all federal funding of, uh, of universities. So it, it, there's an entire industry that watches what the, uh, the Department of Education uh, has to say about this, and they've just redefined harassment to make every single man, woman, and child, every single faculty member arguably guilty of harassment in one fell swoop. And, and they misquoted the Supreme Court in this case. <laughs> they misquoted the Davis opinion. Yeah, that, that was definitely for the legal perfectionists at fire. We, we were like, you, and you had the temerity to misquote the Davis opinion in the course of this? Like, what kind of lawyers are you? But they left out certain words, right? The, yeah. Uh, the objective standard, right? Yeah, they, they left out, they, they talked about it being severe and, and pervasive when the actual quote is, I think, severe, persistent, um, and objectively offensive. And, the, and, and they, so they quoted Davis without quoting one of the most important parts of Davis. Mm -hmm. Now, how does something like this happen? Is this the, I mean, is it government by community organizers now that, <laughs> that Obama's people are kind of taking over these agencies? Or, I mean, how does this happen, something that, that outrageous? Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been wondering about that, but they're definitely, since 2009, since the first, uh, now, the, the Department of Education had actually been at least comparatively sort of uh, calm on, on these issues. Like in 2003, they actually issued a letter to all um, uh, the schools across the country saying, wait, we see now that these codes are being abused to punish uh, per, uh, First Amendment protected speech. So therefore, we want to be very clear. We have no power to make you punish First Amendment speech. We don't want you to punish First Amendment speech. And if you pass harassment codes that violate First Amendment standards, you do that on your own and take your own risk. They did not mention this letter at all. They didn't mention the First Amendment. They didn't mention free speech. They didn't mention their own 2003 explicit letter in the, in the course of this Montana uh, letter. But this has been, um, unfortunately, part of what's been happening in the Department of Education is for, there was at first a, a letter of guidance that was about bullying, and, and it dealt and it had a pretty broad definition of bullying. Then there was they're against bullying. I think. They're against bullying. Yeah. <laughs> Th then there was another one that the, the one that uh, really troubled us uh, back in 2011 on, on April 4th when they issued a letter saying that that uh, in order to deal with the r very real problem of sexual assault on campus, since we only have jurisdiction over harassment and arguably harassment is just a very severe form of assault, that in order to increase, uh, or a very severe form of harassment, that in order to increase uh, pe people getting in trouble for this, you have to lower the confidence with which you convict someone that, uh, on this to preponderance of evidence, which is the lowest legally allowable standard uh, that, that you can be found guilty under. Um, so you know, we were talking about, so you're saying that harassment is an offense so serious we have to be less sure it actually happened. And so this is, this is a double whammy that we're, that, that we're seeing here, is that you've lowered the, and I talk about this in the book, that the, the double whammy is define everything as harassment, define everything um, a, a, as banned, and then lower the confidence with which you can find people guilty of it. Um, and so I, I, like, I, looking at this letter, I just don't understand how a university could possibly comply with it. So what, um, what can be done? What is FIRE doing and what can students do? What can alumni do about it? Well, uh, right now we're just trying to educate people. We're, we're trying to put it as in simple terms as possible because, I mean, we live in First Amendment law. We're, we're, we're weirdly specialized in this. So when we looked at the letter, we looked at what the language was, the fact that they completely rule out Davis, the fact that they create this new separate definition of harassment as distinct from hostile environment, which had never been the, uh, been the case before. Um, you know, when we first publicized about it, I we had to wait a couple days before people were like, oh, my God, they're right. Um, so we're still in the stage of just educating the public about it, but it's going to, you know, definitely alumni. Um, the, the, thing that, the thing that was frustrating about the Dear Colleague letter, the, the one where they lowered the uh, standard of proof, was that universities weren't willing to fight this. And I talked to administrators in private, and they're like, oh, it, it's been terrible since the Dear Colleague letter came out because we have to adjudicate um, all of these offenses at this really low standard, and we, we just don't feel qualified to be able to do this. But they weren't willing to fight it out in public. This, code, th th this new guidance letter, though, goes so far, and it's so impossible for universities to comply with. I'm hopeful that at least some universities will, will just say, will stand up and push back. Because, but if, if not, it's going to be, you know, students who are convicted under this, they're, they're going to have, uh, they should litigate. And they should litigate, and they should name the Department of Education and the Department of Justice. 
Um, and it's not a close call. That's kind of code that the Department of Education has recommended. You know, the, the, it's, it's clearly established in, in First Amendment law going back decades that this, that this will not stand. So definitely alumni, you know, contacting their alma maters, telling them to stand up to this is, is, is tremendously helpful. Reading up on it yourself is really helpful. Um, and I've been glad to see so far that whether I'm talking about this to the National Review or to Huffington Post Live, people are like, yeah, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, um, did Fire suggest or did someone else uh, suggest that, um, th that um, Friends of the First Amendment could start filing all kinds of complaints on campus against, say, the Department of Women's Studies for making, because <laughs> men feel, uh, you know, men feel harassed by this and feel, I, I mean, it's offensive, right? So. Yeah. The, the thing I'm always afraid about, that the, the strategy of let, let's just co-opt this and show how ridiculous it is, is I'm afraid that universities would be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> That they would actually say stuff to the effect of, well, you know, we really do want to prevent an offensive atmosphere. Um, so really, let's just shut everybody up. And and <laughs> and this isn't. I used to make this as a joke, but it's becoming less and less far fetched. Like the the the, the problem of free speech zones on college campuses. Um, we 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 had to actually go into court to fight a school, University of Cincinnati, for goodness sakes, bound by the First Amendment, who limited free speech activities to 0.1 percent of campus and still required 10 days advance notice in order to use that 0.1%. The, the University of Cincinnati was willing to go into court to defend that. And that's the thing, it's kind of like, one of the reasons why this is a problem is it's fear of liability, it's ignorance of these principles, it's, um, but it's also uh, mass, uh, you know, mass bureaucratization, and ultimately, you know, they're more, in some cases, they're more concerned about peace and quiet on campus than anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, in the book, you mention how, especially at prestige schools, at Harvard, you say that the students are afraid. I mean, even students who, who, who've been victims of these absurd codes are afraid to uh, uh, bring a case. Is that right? Um, yeah, uh, that, that's one thing that, that uh, you know, I really tried to emphasize in the book, probably the, well, the, the thinkier aspect of the book, is that we've gotten kind of dismissive of you know, what's roughly and somewhat dismissively referred to as political correctness on campus. And we, when we give these incredible stories, I mean, I open up the book talking about a student who was literally kicked out of college because he made a collage criticizing a parking garage. And students did not care. Uh, faculty members did not care. Um, nobody came to his defense other, other than fire. Um, meanwhile, the, um, the, what was the question again? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, afraid, right. So one of my points is that censorship doesn't really uh, make people, um, doesn't make people change their minds. What it does is it pushes people to not talk to people they disagree with. Mm -hmm. And if you got crude jokes, if you got a body sense of humor, you just say that to your friend who, who, who gets it. If, you have, if you're a conservative or if you're a liberal, you, you just follow three simple rules. Don't talk to people you disagree with. Don't disagree with the professor whose ego can't take it, and um, don't uh, and, and join the uh, ideological groups that reflect what you already already believe. And if you do those three things, it's easy peasy. You're not going to have a problem on on college campuses these days. But the problem is that's supercharging everything that's wrong with our entire society. Is we're all already talking to people we already agree with. So. Um, and the, the problem of this group polarization is something I really emphasize in the book, and it's only helped along by the threat, uh, by the threat of punishment. But one of the most interesting statistics that I came across in the book was a, a study of 24,000 students. They were asked this milquetoast question. Is it safe to hold unpopular positions on campus? Um, and that's a, that's a question that's designed to be a whitewash. That's a question that's designed to get everyone to go, of course, it's safe to merely hold unpopular points of view on campus. Um, you know, I just talk to the people I already agree with. I don't disagree with my professors. Whatever, I can hold them. Nonetheless, even though it was such a weak question, 40%, only 40% of college freshmen strongly agreed with the statement. <laughs> and it goes down every year after that. Only 30% of college seniors strongly agree with the statement that it's safe to merely hold unpopular positions on campus. And most striking of all, only 16.7% of college professors strongly agreed with the statement that it's safe to hold unpopular positions on campus. Right. That's, um, now, how much of this is due to the fact that academia has become kind of... Uh, has become more concentrated, especially liberals 
on the tenure committee hiring other liberals and things, and people tend to get extreme the more that they talk to people like themselves. I, I definitely think groupthink is, is a big yeah. contributor to this problem. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if you're only talking to people who agree with you, you end up in a situation where people who don't agree with you are seem to be basically heretics, right. and therefore they're, 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 they're fighting truth, they're, try, they're fighting revelation, and therefore they can be shut down. Um, and I think that the, it's one of the things that I try to talk about. There's lots of legal fixes to this problem that need to happen, and certainly the Department of Education just make things a billion times worse. Mm -hmm. But the cultural fix is that we somehow have gotten out of the idea that intelligent, educated people, it is a hallmark of intelligent, educated people, that they should seek out the intelligent person with whom they disagree. That has fallen out of fashion on campus. If that actually were to go back into fashion, if, if that were to be considered what, what smart people do, that could make uh, a lot of the problems at Fire C go, go away pretty quickly, and also, for that matter, make our national discourse a lot less tedious. Mm -hmm. um, well, how much of it is that, uh, I mean, talking about the New Victorians, people said that, uh, that the academy has sort of gone back uh -huh. to its founding roots when there were religious schools that were intended to promote a certain moral uh, or religious point of view, and now that, that we've sort of circled back to that, where social justice is the new moral teaching that a college is supposed to do, and that that becomes the prism, you know, through which you uh, you see things, and that and, and therefore you get the same kind of uh, Victorian rules for for what you can say and what you can't say. Absolutely, and that's been one of the interesting things is how some of these codes end up sounding, even, even though they're nominally, uh, you know, expressed with an idea of being very progressive and very mm -hmm. forward thinking, that they end up sounding like something out of Anthony Comstock's mouth. Mm -hmm. There, there, we've been doing Speech Code of the Month um, uh, at FIRE since 2005, and we are in absolutely no danger of running out of material. <laughs> but Florida Gulf Coast University, my mom's British, so I especially appreciate this one, They're, they had a blanket rule that simply banned expressions deemed inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just something to write out of, of Comstock. At the same time, well, code that's actually repeated, that was defeated at the University of Connecticut, but then revived verbatim um, at Drexel University 15 years later, banned inconsiderate jokes. <laughs> and wait for it. Inappropriately directed laughter. <laughs> So at the extremes, they start really sounding like Victorians, and and it really and it ends up they end up coming to the same conclusions at the extremes. There's a case at University of Denver that I'm going to be talking about where a professor was teaching a class. Um, you know Thaddeus Russell. Mm -hmm. This could totally be a class taught taught by Thaddeus Russell. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, it, it's about taboos. It's about drugs and sex and masturbation and taboos in in American history. And the, that's the content of the, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the class. It's explained in the syllabus. A student was offended by the content of the actual <laughs> class, not anything other than that. And that professor remains uh, guilty of harassment at the University of Denver. And did the student take the class, or he just saw the, the, uh, the course syllabus? <laughs> you know, I think, it was, I think it was actually an anonymous report, too. Okay. <laughs> um, I love the story about Isaac uh, Rosenblum. Oh, that, that you had. At Mississippi, where was it? In, uh, Hines College yeah. in Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah. Th 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 this this contains strong language. I I, <laughs> I, I have I, I have a whole section of the book that that the subtitle of it is um, uh, swearing on campus, and I have in parentheses uh, also known as don't read if you can't abide cussing. <laughs> Because it's weird. It, it's the, the, I feel like people on all, all over the spectrum, they can be very good on freedom of speech, but they don't like the F word. Um, it's just strange for me to run into this. I live in Brooklyn. I, I take this for granted. But the, this is a case w of a guy who was um, finishing up his degree in order to become a paramedic. Um, he, uh, after class, he found out that he got a particular grade. Uh, he got, I forget what it was, but he looked at it and goes, man, this is going to fuck up my GPA to another student. The professor starts uh, sh shouting, I'm saying, you can't talk like that in my presence, you're, you're going to detention. <laughs> so it's clearly a professor, like this guy is, a, is 29 years old. Detention. Yeah. He, he has, <laughs> and his permanent record. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he has two children. Um, and he's studying to be a paramedic, and they found this student guilty. And it's amazing because we actually have this whole, t his whole testimony on tape. It's like this weird, surreal, um, the, 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 Who is the teacher, by the way? Rachel, the, the, I, I forgot what her name was. Uh -huh. um, tried not to focus too much yeah, yeah. on her because yeah. if it just died there, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. Right. But yeah. they had a hearing, and this, this the, the student is is you know he's quoting papish, he's quoting Supreme Court opinions, he's coming off as very intelligent, and nonetheless, in in this hearing, they find him guilty of flagrant disrespect. <laughs> 
<laughs> he, um, he, he's going to lose his Pell Grant. And, there's, and they're basically trying to make the argument that a paramedic, um, you know, uh, but going in the real world, you can't be expected to swear. And it's kind of like, dude, if I'm having a heart attack and a paramedic shows up and like looks at me and goes, oh, fudge, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little weirded out by that. <laughs> um, why is it, I mean, how did it come to be progressive to have, you know, sex codes and, 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 and this, you know, that it, it's a strange thing how, uh, um, how we got there? You know, I, I, I can't exactly say how, but it definitely is sort of the morphing out of hostile environment mm -hmm. law combined with groupthink, combined with the fact, I mean, honestly, I think it's the fact, uh, I went to Stanford for law school, mm -hmm. and that was one of the more sort of, uh, it, it was a culture that didn't quite understand that how much it was uh, reflecting a very upper class way of looking at the world, but they thought of this as progressive, so everybody should think this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of groupthink, I think there's a lot of wealth, and I think there's a lot of um, this weird kind of, like, weird sort of like, what I refer to as selective uptightness. Mm -hmm. Um, th that, uh, th that people are able to turn on and turn off, that uh, people have just gotten much too schooled in, in, in the ability to like, I like that joke, I like that joke, I'm offended and I'm gonna make a big deal out of it, partially because I might not like you or what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So And our side has the majority here so we can make the rules? Yeah, that, that, so. yeah exactly. So, so we, we've learned to selectively turn off relativism and, and uptightness. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, you talk about how the calls for this kind of restriction on campus are being mirrored off campus. We're seeing the same kind of trend toward that. Yeah, no, that, that, that's the stuff that, that, that concerns me, is that, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. When I did an NPR show when the, when the book came out, and there was a student who was on my panel who was supposed to be very pro-free speech. And she was really good on this stuff until she was asked about policies at her own college. And she said, oh, yeah, they're very good. I mean, we do have a free speech zone, and you do have to wait 10 days in advance. Uh, you have to apply 10 days in advance to, in order to use it, but they enforce it fairly. <laughs> so what I'm afraid of is that we have a whole generation that is so unthinkingly deferential to authority, or at least used to being told where they can, say, where, where they can speak, what they can say, and when they can say it, um, that, it that it poses a, a threat to the First Amendment. Because the First Amendment can be strong, but if nobody knows it exists, it doesn't really matter all that much anymore. So you see this speech um, creeping out. Like, I, I talk in the book about how I, I, wrote for, I write for the Huffington Post, and I wrote an article about this um, uh, Harvard Law Journal article that, that came to the defense of speech codes, of campus speech codes. With one, it didn't cite any of the opinions in which they've been defeated, and they've been defeated over and over again over, over the course of the years. But also with no sense that, oh, wait a second, I'm demanding that universities have the power to censor me. The, the, um, it struck me that uh, 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 some of the stuff about obscenity, like uh, Rush Limbaugh calling um, uh, uh, Sandra Fluke a, a slut, that, yeah. that it, suddenly that word became as if no one had heard that word ever used in public about a woman. And, 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 and you saw these conniptions that when Bill Maher was talking about, he'd used worse language about Sarah Palin, but that was all right. It was different from this. And, and so we're seeing, I mean, how much of it is just people feign, feigned outrage, basically? I, I, absolutely. That's, that, that's one of, uh, <laughs> it's funny to say, it's one of my favorite sections of my book, yeah. um, which is kind of an obnoxious way to put it. Um, but I, I talk about the, the problem of feigned outrage, because first it was a Sandra Fluke thing, and then people were turning on Bill Maher to, about what he said about Sarah Palin, but it, re it reached its stupid crescendo um, when uh, Bo uh, Robert De Niro, uh, at, at a, a Democratic fundraiser, uh, with regards to Callista Gingrich, makes this joke. Are we really ready for a white first lady? It's cute. It's a titter joke. Like, it, it's yeah. not like a joke that, that really should offend anybody, but Newt Gingrich goes on saying, I'm demanding an apology <laughs> for that joke. <laughs> and Bill Maher wrote a piece that it, in the New York Times that we thought was great, that was, uh, w w we should have a no offense day, no feigned outrage day, um, that we need, to, uh, we need to stop pretending we're, we're so, we can't bear the words that people use against us because it's just BS and it's just tactical. And I totally agreed with it, but I emphasize in the book, but you gotta understand, this stuff has been weaponized and perfected on campus for decades. <laughs> and if you really want to stop this sort of weird dance where people say, I'm offended and therefore you, uh, you should shut up now, um, we have to start calling it out on college campuses. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got one more question, and then we'll open it up. Um, what are alumni doing, and what can alumni do about campus? I mean, I mean do people, I mean, I, I, I've seen this at the, at the school I went to, Yale, 
has gotten a lot of attention from FIRE. It's been ranked in, in Harvard. Um, has there been any consequence from, uh, do these schools pay a penalty for suppressing free speech and, 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 and for taking away students' rights to a fair trial? The thing is, you know, um, alumni are much more powerful than they know. Mm -hmm. um, they, when, when we have a case in which we know that uh, alumni are actually writing universities saying, um, this is outrageous or I'm not giving to you anymore, it can take a handful of alumni to, to get a university to go, whoa, 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 never mind, never mind. Um, because mm -hmm. these, aren't, these are not necessarily brave people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the, uh, so we really want to get more, more help from alumni, but I think there's a fatalism about how much they can actually help that is completely unwarranted. And do they want to get their own grandkids in? Is that the... Is I, that I, I, I think that probably doesn't help any. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience here? Hi, you, uh, I know that in your book, you uh, you tell a, a, another kind of story about uh, was it a southern university uh, some university that was suppressing a, re a Christian group's opportunity to show Mel Gibson's movie oh, yeah. at the same time that uh, another group was doing you know <laughs> fuck a fuck Jesus uh, sculpture or some sort yeah. so that groups pe the kind of people that you know maybe wouldn't come to meetings like this are being oppressed as well by. Uh, free speech. Let me ask you a second question as well. Just uh, why do you think things were better in 1970 or circa 1965? Uh, why did things deteriorate? So that's the other broad question. So that's my two questions. Okay. Well, the first one is a case that people, you know, and I try to repeat this case a lot. It's a place called Indian River College in Florida. It has 12,000 students. It's not even a small college. But they told a Christian group there that it could not show Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, um, which people may not know this, but it remains the, uh, at least at the time, was the highest the box uh, office rated non-English language film of all time. It's an, it's an Aramaic for people who don't know. And they were told that they couldn't show it because it was offensive and controversial and that it was rated R. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, they were hosting a skit that included, um, uh, on, on campus, that, that included something called Fucking for Jesus <laughs> that was about masturbating to the crucifix. And we were very clear about this. That's protected, and so is watching the Passion of the Christ. It's absolutely outrageous that, that, that you would uh, you know, uh, allow one and ban the other. But the double standards, these systems cannot exist without double standards. Because when you look at the plain language of these speech codes, everyone's guilty of violating them. But they're only able to exist with an implicit, speech, uh, with implicit double standard. So the, the double standards are always striking. Um, with regards to the, uh, the, the second question, why did it get so much worse? Um, you know, FIRE doesn't pretend that there was ever some perfect golden age for, for, for free speech on college campuses. My dad came here in the 1950s. He, he, he thought that universities, uh, University of Wisconsin was much more uptight than schools he went to in Germany. Um, he, uh, but there was a free speech movement, and it did actually change things. And I joke sometimes that there was a perfect week in 1977 when the old censorship had ended and the new one hadn't begun yet, when, when everybody, uh, when, when everything was fine. Virginia Postrel, by the way, who, who used to be the editor of Reason, said, yeah, you're totally right, I went to school, I went to Princeton in, in the late 70s, it actually was pretty much perfect in that respect. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem to be cyclical, though. And the, the, instant, the, the instinct to censor is something that I think is just fundamentally human. That's one of the reasons why the, the First Amendment is so brilliant. It says, you're going to be biased. You're going to figure out an argument for shutting people down who have opinions you dislike. So let's do this. Let's have this brilliant idea. Let's take that entirely off the table. Uh, I just wanted to dispute something you said. <laughs> I, I don't think... I don't think Newt Gingrich was the uh, nadir of stupidity uh -oh. after the Sandra Fluke thing. I think that came when uh, Gloria Allred, oh. uh, the uh, uh, famous uh, feminist lawyer from Southern California, wrote to the district attorney of Palm Beach County, Florida, asking him to investigate Rush Limbaugh on charges of criminal libel under a statute dating from the 1880s that makes, makes it a crime Obviously, this hasn't been enforced in a long time. It makes it a crime to uh, question, to accuse a woman falsely of a want of chastity. Which, by, by the way, since Fluke was saying she needed free birth control and she's not married, I think it, 
Limbaugh is presumptively innocent of that, whatever you think of what he said. But I think that was the dumbest, uh, the dumbest moment. I, I, that'll be in the next book. <laughs> I'm totally just stealing the mic. Sorry about that. Um, just to follow up uh, uh, what uh, Gene asked, because uh, I had the same kind of thought. You had the free speech movement in the yeah. early 60s. That is the beginning of the new left, as it used to be called, or the old new left. Um, okay, so maybe 1977, Virginia Postrel's undergraduate career was the, was the highlight. But was there a large cultural thing that happened? Is there an event that you can point to in the earlier mid-80s? Because by the time I was a freshman in 86, this was what was happening, that, that the new regime was, hap was starting to begin. Was there any precipitating events? In, you know, it's college? really impossible to know, but definitely what Harvey Silverglate and Alan Kors, uh, to, to the two founders of FIRE, uh, uh, attributed to in their book, The Shadow University, was an overwhelmingly positive thing. Um, by the early 1980s, by the, actually by the late 70s, you had an unprecedented number of minorities and openly gay people and women going, going to colleges. But, and there was friction. There, there, there were people actually, God forbid, getting in arguments with each other and not liking each other and being nasty to each other uh, here and there. But the idea was, you, you know, as a lot of people said, just, just throw up the white flag, uh, essentially to redefine this all as harassment and just ban people from interacting with each other. Um, so th the overall theory is that, is that from an overwhelmingly positive development came this really sort of restrictive idea. But the problem is it fed into this idea that administrators and, 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 uh, are the heroes, that, that, that they're, the, they're the protectors of, of, of everybody else's right. And the problem with that is it ends up developing kind of like, that's why I think it's so comparable to Victorianism. Because there's a sense of sort of like, I am the one true defender of goodness and right, and that means you should shut up. And that, that, takes, on a, that takes on a life of its own. So there's a, there's a theme of stridency that you're you're hitting on, and it, but is it is it necessarily the far left or necessarily the far right? It, what is how does that work in terms of the polarity of the political spectrum? Yeah, uh, that that's a great question. It, it is a mess when it comes down to it. Um, who's going to censor who and for what reason? Sometimes, and I'm very clear about this in the book, it's not all political correctness. A lot of it is you criticize the university and I'm going to punish you. As I always refer to this, it's old Dean Wormer stuff. It's not any, any real uh, you know, surprise in that sense. So sometimes you'll have someone who considers himself very far left who is awesome on freedom of speech. And sometimes you have just a careerist administrator um, who uh, just wants to punish somebody for, for hurting the branding uh, of the university. But in other cases, you have people who are true believers. They think that speech should be stopped uh, if, if it's offensive to anyone, particularly me. Um, and, that, uh, and, and those, in some cases, can be the most intractable people to fight. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about high schools. In 1968 in high school, I wrote a, uh, an essay for my high school paper that got parents so upset that um, they, they started boycotts and the school administration, um, uh, the, the school board with, withheld funding saying, <clears throat> and we said, it cried freedom of speech and they said, you can say anything you want, we just don't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So they told us to raise our own funds, so we wrote a play to raise money to be performed entirely in the nude, <coughs> and we got all our money back. So, uh, whereas uh, today I feel like if I had done that, oh, yeah. I would be under you know psychological scrutiny and lockdown or something oh, yeah. or other. And all I had done was suggest that um, because um, hunters would trespass on our land and shoot up our pet rabbits, I just suggested that hunters should shoot their own. Uh, pets, not ours. That's all I suggested. So, and that's what got everybody upset. So what happens now? What happens in high school? And are, have you been involved in those cases? And is, are the laws any different? Like, you know, it, it, if it's you're a, a minor? It's a great question, and, I, and we get it a lot. You know, I, I've said this almost since I've, I've, I've been with FIRE, and I've been with FIRE now for nearly 12 years, is we get a lot of ridiculous cases submitted to us by high school students. Um, but, you know, my belief is that in order to be an effective organization, um, it's a good idea for a nonprofit to stay narrow. And until you've actually solved the problem you were founded to solve, then you should not be looking for mission creep. But the problem in K through 12 is ridiculous. Um, Lenore can, can, can attest to this. Um, there needs to be a group like FIRE for high schools. And if someone wants to found that and run it, I will get behind them and push. I've been saying that for years, and I want there to be an organization. But, but one of the reasons, another reason why we don't get involved in high school cases is the law is very different. 
Um, they are minors, um, and they, there's, a, there's a series of bad Supreme Court cases starting in the 80s, but the mo most recently um, finishing in a case called Frederick, um, that severely limit the free speech rights of, of high school students. Um, the high watermark being the Tinker a black armband case from the late 1960s, and since then it's just been downhill. Um, I mean, the, the Frederick case, which is the famous bong hits for Jesus case, was one of the strangest opinions I have ever read in Supreme Court history. Um, th th you have uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts trying to, f trying to puzzle over what bong, hit, what, what do, uh, what bong hits for Jesus meant, and so he keeps on putting brackets into it. It's like, perhaps it meant uh, brackets do bong hits for Jesus, or bong hits for Jesus, brackets are good. And I'm like, no, you can't censor something because of the bracketed meaning. It's a freaking joke. <laughs> but the situation for K through 12 when it comes to free speech has gotten really bad. <laughs> They're trying to give Jesus bong hits, wasn't it? Possibly. So yes, there needs to be a fire for K through 12. Okay, thanks. I, I just have a quick question, because you're, you're talking about a closed environment, which is school, further education, and so forth. But you sort of tantalized us by saying that this is going outside of that closed environment. And you know, as somebody who's a little bit active on uh, Twitter, I have noticed something like this happening on Twitter, a balkanization where people just talk to each other. I wonder if you could explain to us how this has translated from the campus environment to, for example, Twitter or Facebook or any of the other sort of chatty media where we are. Yeah, actually this is something, a, a topic that I'd like to write another book on. Like I, I, I talk about it briefly, um, uh, or actually I guess I come, it's a theme I come back to a lot about sort of hyperpolarization in the country. But what I find, what, what you're talking about is what you know, Negroponte called the daily me. That essentially in, in cyber environments you can, you, you can find like-minded people and you can only talk to them and only get your information from them, which leads to polarization. And that's something that I, you know, as, a, as someone who was very interested in cyber law, I, 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 I was always very fascinated by. But what I actually find even more interesting is the, is the premise by uh, Bill Bishop in a book called The Big Sort, which came out in 2008, which is it not just that we're living in cyber environments of the, of the like-minded, that we're living increasingly in counties and communities of increasing, uh, increasing ideological similarity. And when you have the situation, you end up really, really accelerating the process of group polarization and viewing outsiders as heretics and insiders as good or at least you know, bound by our community rules. And my point is, I don't believe that it's higher education that's caused this problem, but it's our best hope for fixing it. To, that, that, we, uh, that we could actually be educated people would say, you know what, am I, am I stereotyping what people in Kansas think? Am I stereotyping um, what, what uh, atheists think if you're a Christian or what Christians think if you're atheist? Um, it, that's, that's a good critical thinking mindset to have, but really what we're doing more of particularly, and it, um, we're, we're not even at the point where we're not encouraging people to, 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 to talk to each other. We're actually actively discouraging them to say anything that could hurt anyone's feelings, which makes this idea of actually becoming more open and actually trying to get, be, make people suspicious of their own confirmation bias is impossible if you, can't, if you can get in trouble just for speaking your mind. Am I, am I free to ask a politically incorrect question? <laughs> you bet. Um, it, it seems like we're shifting to a state of affairs where feelings are taking the place of actions. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, to what extent do you think that the increasing numbers, I think there's a fair case to be made that women pay more attention to feelings than men do. And to what extent do you think that increasing numbers of women on campus <laughs> Or, or in elementary schools or high schools is giving greater preference to feelings and being offended than the abstract principle of free speech. I, I, I certainly have had heard that, that argument made before, both by people who are being critical of it and by people who are actually saying, and this is a good thing, this is part of the sort of the feminization process of, of campuses. Um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, agnostic uh, to the overall theory. Uh, partially because I actually see a lot of what I do, and I'm very aware of this, is that a lot of the problems that you see today are problems of comfort. 
there are problems of comfort and wealth, and, uh, and, and that essentially it just makes sense that in the late 19th century, as Britain was getting much, much richer, they start becoming really obsessed with how, uh, how much they can show off their status through showing off excessive displays of morality and excessive displays of self-righteousness. So even without um, an increased influence of women, I think you would still have this, when you reach a certain level of comfort, people start in, engaging in these kind of competitive displays of morality. So I think that this would be a problem under any circumstances just from a more affluent, more uh, stratified, more isolated society like you currently see on, in higher education. Um, Greg, could you talk a little bit about how the protections of the First Amendment differ between high schools, public universities, private universities, and general life? Absolutely. Um, so K through 12, um, particularly K through 8, yeah, you have the lowest uh, First Amendment protections at, oh, so the first distinction is uh, private colleges are bound uh, by the First Amendment, public colleges are not. And I'll, and I'll get back to that. Well, so, so, sorry, uh, private colleges are not bound by the First Amendment, public colleges are. Jeez, thanks. Uh, well, but it's indirect, though. That, that, that's, the, that's the Leonard Law. Um, the, the Leonard Law impl uh, impo uh, applies First Amendment standards to non-sectarian colleges in the state of California. Um, so uh, so uh, public colleges are bound by the First Amendment. It just doesn't mean very much in K through 8. It doesn't mean, uh, it means more but not much more in high school, and it means a lot in higher education. There's very strong case law about the free speech rights of faculty and students in higher education going back to the 1950s, a case called Sweezy, where they actually end the, the quote about academic freedom with, and, and if we can put any straight jacket on, on our, 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 our nation's students, our, our nation will stagnate and die. It's really strong language coming out of the Supreme Court, and, and it's been consistently, uh, consistently quite good on the Supreme Court level. Private colleges um, are not bound by the First Amendment, um, but our overall stance is, is that they, need, they are bound by their promises. So Yale and Harvard promise freedom of speech to high heaven. They have glowing, glowing promises. And it makes sense to hold them to these promises, um, not just out of fairness, but be, they get some of the best students in the country, they get some of the best faculty in the country, and they get literally billions of dollars in donations over the years, partially by portraying themselves as a citadel of freedom of speech. They better deliver on that. Uh, I'm normally not a vindictive person. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great opening. Possibly, possibly my ex-wife might have a slightly different <laughs> opinion, but generally. The biggest problem that we see, in, in my mind, one of the reasons that this continually gets worse, and, and Alan Kors and Harvey Silvergrade's original book, The Shadow University, was to which yours is really an incredible sequel, but it really has been around for a long time. With all the good that's being done, I can't remember anybody who's gotten in trouble, no matter how ridiculous the position, the most ridiculous points that were made, going back to Alan and Harvey and in your book, it seems that virtually nobody has had to pay a price for it. And until somebody does, I can't see that it's going to change. Well, pr prior to uh, this letter coming out on Thursday, we were making great progress on this. And, and the, vi the big villain of the beginning of this book, um, uh, the, 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 per the president who punished the student for the collage protesting the parking garage, after years of litigation, was held personally liable for this. Um, and that was, a, that was part of uh, the fire's grand legal strategy is to pierce something that's kind of a boring term, but to pierce qualified immunity and actually start getting some of these uh, bad, uh, bad actors found personally liable. And, he, and so it was $50,000 that's supposed to come out of his own pocket, but they're also asking for $2 million in attorney's fees. That will get administrators' attention. That will get campus's attention. And there's been a couple of, 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 of uh, piercing of, of qualified immunity. The problem is we've made such progress on this but now that the, the, but the standard is that you knew or should have known or had actual notice that you were violating the Constitution. Um, and then you can be held personally liable. And this has been FIRE's grand plan for a very long time. But the Department of Education and the Department of Justice letter really throws some ambiguity into that because now universities, even if they're knowingly violating the Constitution, have no regard for it whatsoever, can now say, eh, the federal government made me do it. So we got our work cut out for us.
so one of the things that I noticed from this was this kind of idea of the people who are making the accusations claiming that they're the ones that are having free speech to make the accusation. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's why it's so frustrating. Because as somebody that's saying something, you're saying, I'm saying this. Yeah. But the people who are saying, I'm offended by this, which is why I get to say I'm offended by it. Right. And it well, the thing is, it kind of like, you know, counter speech is the solution, ultimately. And if you just say, I'm offended and you're a jerk for saying that, then great, we're on, we're on both of your sides, that's the way you're supposed to resolve this stuff. But when you say, I'm offended and therefore someone has to be punished for it, um, then, then, you're, then you lose us. Then we're like, no, 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 that's not the way it's supposed to work. But a really striking case of how muddled this stuff gets was a case that I talk about, about Sally Jacobson um, in, at Northern Kentucky University. I talk about it in the book. And th there was a pro-life display on campus. It was a bunch of little white crosses. It was approved by the, uh, by the student government, not the student government, by the administration. It was you know, a, a loud protest. And Sally Jacobson, who's a professor there, goes in front of her class and says, I, want my, uh, I think we should exercise our First Amendment rights to destroy this display. And they go out and they destroy it. And even afterwards, when they're asking her about it, she really seemed to believe that she had a First Amendment right to destroy someone else's speech. And you, and you, see, that, you see this idea repeated over and over again, and how often we have to say, no. Like, there's been a bunch of cases where students have shut down speeches by like, visiting dignitaries, by, uh, by speakers, and, they, and sometimes they'll come to fire for help. <laughs> and we're like, you are on the wrong side of free speech. <laughs> We're not going to help you. <laughs> uh, as someone who uh, very recently left the college campus, um, one of the things I've noticed is that while uh, formal actions taken to restrict free speech uh, certainly are not as rare as they should be, are relatively infrequent compared to informal ways of stifling uh, free speech. Uh, and, and part of that, I think, is because, as you said, there's this uh, tolerance of it uh, from people who are, you know, if, if a professor says, that's offensive, you shouldn't say that, most kids will say, okay, I won't do that. So I'm wondering, obviously that's something that's much more difficult to litigate, and I'm not sure if it even should be litigated. And, and so my question is, what are your insights on how best to uh, fight that informal speech code? Yeah, that, that's an absolutely terrific question. Um, the uh, you know, I think a lot about this, about um, trying to call out some of these weird behaviors that we've gotten so used to um, engaging in to sort of a trump card against people who say things that we dislike. And, and I think everybody at this point engages these to some degree, where you say, I'm offended, or I don't want to talk about it, or how dare you. We're just too quick uh, to do that kind of stuff. So calling that stuff out, I've, I've even tried this out in some friends. You know, when someone immediately starts grandstanding, I'm kind of like, you know, Tone it down. Let's actually talk about you know, the fact you're offended is an emotional state. Let's talk about what actually is happening here. And it's actually worked in a couple different cases where we proceeded then to actually have a real serious conversation about it. But I think you have to get people, one, you have to pierce the bubble. You have to actually be able to say, you, you know, that these are our values. That it's that, that actually, to some degree, we've watched First Amendment organizations, other First Amendment organizations across the country in different cases, fall, trip over themselves saying, well, this speech is offensive. I defend it nonetheless. We try to avoid doing that because that, that, that muddies the water. We're saying kind of like, no, this is a principle. It would be ridiculous to say that we're apologizing for the speech in the first place. Um, the principle is what we're talking about here. This is a system that we, uh, that, that we believe in. But I do think that one of the things that could really help, uh, have you ever been to the IQ squared debates? The, the terrific series, and it points out this, you know, almost forgotten idea that debates on meaty topics on college campuses can actually be fun. <laughs> that they can be joyous, that you can actually have some fun. You can, have pe you can even have smart people who disagree. I spoke at Yale um, a couple of weeks ago, and I had, um, no, no, sorry. Uh, oh, my God, I got them confused. I spoke at Harvard. Yikes. Um, and... <laughs> Yikes. And, um, and, and there was someone there who was a conservative student explaining kind of like, yeah, I try to actually have, uh, have um, uh, uh, you know, debates on meaty topics, but they'll protest if I have someone on the other side of some of this stuff. <laughs> and so that's teaching people that debate and, 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 and discussion can be fun is something that, you, you know, they have orientation programs at universities where I think they really emphasize sort of like your right, you know, to, to, to use a sort of somewhat hackneyed term, you're right not to be offended. What they really should be doing is preparing people that for the idea that debate and discussion is awesome 
and can actually be really delightful. I think if you change expectations, that, that's the way you start addressing it. Um, given all this, could you speak to whether and where you've actually seen unlikely allies on campuses? Oh, fire's all about unlikely allies. Uh, I, I, I'm extraordinarily proud of when we do amicus briefs, you, you know, having you know, we'll have the camp, uh, Christian Legal Society, the ACLU, David Horowitz, you know, you, you know, like all on the same amicus brief. You know, we've got atheists and conservatives and liberals. Oh, and there was one, one where we had all that entire group and the, um, uh, the Center for Sexual Expression all on the same one. So we're always making unlikely allies. Um, and I think that, you know, in some cases, when we were fighting free speech zones at first at West Virginia University, we were working with a group called Students for Economic Justice, and they were awesome on this stuff. Um, they were having, and definitely there are other groups with similar names who have been terrible on, on free speech issues, but these students were having protests of the free speech zone, and when students would come up and, like, uh, when, uh, and yell at them, go like, oh, you know, take a bath, hippie, they'd cheer the people yelling at them for expressing, <laughs> expressing their freedom of speech. So we, we work... Yeah, exactly. So th the students get this better than the administrators do. Um, and wh when, I, when I do shows about this, when I do the Huffington Post Live about this, I, had, I, I felt like I walked into sort of a setup where you had, um, you, you had a Muslim American student, you had a, uh, a conservative student, you had a, a very left-wing professor and a professor we defended in one case, and it, the show ended up being almost slightly boring because everybody was like, yeah, speech codes are ridiculous and speech zones are ridiculous. And it's like, okay, well, we all agree. Then why does this stuff keep happening? And it's partially, you know, it's partially momentum. It's partially that the the, the 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 number of bureaucrats on college campuses exceeded the number of people involved in in, uh, uh, in instruction as of 2005. It's just been getting, yeah, it's just been getting, and that's on average. Um, it's just been getting bigger and bigger. And when you have so many people whose job is to police um, the, the daily lives of students, shock upon shock, they start overdoing it. Um, so. The, nice, the one good piece of news at that is that the reason why college has gotten so expensive and the reason why free speech and due process are in such trouble on college campuses is one and the same. And having some good competing models of universities that are leaner and meaner could really make a big difference. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Greg Lucana, for, um, for some great thoughts tonight, for a great book um, on learning liberty. And thank you, a Museum of Sex, and, uh, um, and Julian and Kendra and Reason. Thank you. And Gary, and Gary Arstrom.